So perhaps Mickey, if you want to start and say a few words. Uh, hi guys, uh, my name is Mickey. Uh, we've all come here from the local community in Kensington, Notting Hill, Labrador Grove, to say like to have, to have a talk with you guys. I myself lived two minutes from Grenfell Tower and had a lot of friends, family in the tower. Uh, yeah, it's quite an emotive subject, as you can imagine. But yeah, ask away. Any questions you have, we're here to answer. I introduce myself. I'm Ziad. Um, also a local resident of the area. Um, I've lived there for 31 years now. Um, and as you can imagine, something like Grenfell happening uh, very close to home is something that you can't forget. Well, you can't take the images of what happened that night from yourself, uh, from your mind. Um, and things like this, we just thank you for the opportunity to come and speak to people who aren't from the local community as well, just to understand, hear a few of our stories of where we are 21 months on and why we're here today to try and um, make sure that the world doesn't forget what happened that night. Um, my name's Ines. Um, I'm a survivor from the tower. Uh, I sat my GCSE that morning of the fire. Um, I'm not sure if you know of me. Um, so, yeah. Um, my name is Tiago, uh, also a survivor. Uh, this is my sister right here. And, um, yeah. And I'm Reese. I'm a local resident as well. Just live opposite Grenfell. And, yeah, just cool. took the role of activism, I guess, after Grenfell and just taking the fight to the council, so, yeah. So I think my first question would be, and it's Mickey, following up on what you said about the raw emotion of the subject, how, after the incident, did you find a way to channel that into activism? To be honest, it's like, it wasn't a conscious choice to channel into activism. The community we're from, like everyone will tell you, we genuinely care about each other and we care about our neighbours. We're the kind of community that you can knock on each other's door and ask to borrow something if you don't have it. The kind that will help each other if they fall down in the street. So something like Grenfell, that it was the worst thing I've seen in my life. I've never seen. It's a loss of life on such a tragic scale, such an insane disaster to happen, especially when you find out it's needless. It was a needless loss of life. It's like, I was, so, I was thrown so, so off kilt that my normal life couldn't continue without fighting for justice. Yeah. I'm sure Zee has something to say. To yeah, I mean, even just to, to echo those words, I think, I mean, everyone sitting here was, don't, we don't come from a background of activists or we're not known to be on the front line of, of, of such situations. But what Mickey was saying about our community, it's important for people to understand the community because you hear Notting Hill and a lot of people who aren't from the area automatically think, oh, Notting Hill Gate, multi-million pound homes and lifestyles of the rich and famous. And unfortunately, that's not, that's not the entire case. We're very diverse, a massive split between the very wealthy and the very poor. Um, but we all get along and we all live day to day and we, you know, we mingle and we gain experiences from, from others. And what happened that night, I don't think anyone had planned to be as heavily involved as, as we have ended up being. As Mickey said, it was, it was that natural instinct, that natural wanting, want to help. And as Mickey mentioned, we, I mean, we're the type of people in the community that will help your neighbour carry her shopping up the stairs. So on a small scale to that, to then see an entire block of flats that are so familiar that you would see day in, day out, on fire, there was no other choice but to get involved. It's, it's, a, it's a very hard situation to turn your back on and walk away. Even though I'm sure a lot of us have hit rock bottoms, being very low, very depressed about the situation. Um, everyone naturally would have that want to maybe walk away and kind of focus on themselves. But witnessing a tragedy as, as big as Grenfell is, is, is something that you, you can't walk away from. And we found ourselves not by choice, but we found ourselves in the situation doing what we're doing now. Um, and so, yeah, no, it's very important to make sure that people understand where, who we are and what we were as a community, because it's, the media don't <coughs> always portray or give the message out as clearly as, as we'd, we'd like to hope. Um, 
And so it kind of falls onto our shoulders to kind of spread that message and let people meet who we are and the everyday people of Labrock Grove and Latimer Road, you know what I mean? This is, this is who we are and we're here to make sure that one, the situation is never forgotten and two, hopefully we can push change to make sure that it never happens again. Um, and really just to honour those 72 lives that were lost that night because again, this, it was avoidable. The, the tragedy that happened in Grenfell was completely avoidable. Um, and yeah, we need to make sure that, you know, other people living in tower blocks with similar cladding to, to what's on Grenfell don't have to go to sleep at night thinking that if a fire on the second floor breaks out, that me on the 13th floor, I won't be able to get out of my building alive. And mm -hmm. then, Unless you have anything else to add. I think for me, I'm so involved because before, um, I was so ignorant to the reasons of the fire. Before, my mum always used to bang on about me about the regeneration and the gentrification happening. And I was so ignorant to it. I just used to dismiss it, like whatever. And then to see that happening to my friends and, that, and knowing that I possibly could have been involved beforehand to stop that, I think that's fueled me on a bit more now to, to never ever let anything like that happen again. So I just, yeah, I think that's one of my main, main reasons. And obviously it is my community, so I can't turn my back on it like Zia says, but when I think about how I did let my community down beforehand, because I didn't sign any petition, I didn't question the cladding going on. So I think I get wound up at myself and I want to make that right as well for, for everyone. And obviously. And when we talk about cladding in, in, in tower blocks, we have to understand that fires within high story buildings or tower blocks is a common event it happens the structure of the building and the way these buildings are made should prevent that fire spreading now what should happen is there should be at least an hour between each floor if a fire is to spread and with an hour it's usually enough time for the fire brigade to come in get involved and make sure that that fire is put out worst case scenario you might have damage to two or three properties We've got another tower block across the, um, a, a few, about a mile or so from Grenfell Tower. Concrete building, about six months before Grenfell, there was a flat fire on the 14th floor or so, and it was dealt with and it was put out. We have to understand that my point earlier when I talk about what people assume of living in an area like Notting Hill Gate or in North Kensington, our concrete blocks don't match the image that the area is trying to portray or that the council will try to portray. The eyesore of a concrete building like Grenfell Tower is, is, is deemed to put off investors or potential homeowners or property buyers to come into the area and purchase because they look like concrete jungles. They look like rough housing estates. So really and truly, you have to think about why the cladding was put on the Grenfell Tower and it was, the building was an eyesore. And so using the cladding to make the building look nicer and to kind of invite more investors into, into the local area um, has really cost us 72 lives, 72 friends and family and neighbors, women, children, mothers, unborn children, children who were still being carried by their mum, all because a building was deemed as an eyesore. I think the most upsetting point now for me as I'm going on now is that the fact we're 21 months on from the tower, the tragedy at Grenfell Tower and we still have over 100 blocks in London covered in the exact same cladding and they're only tall buildings. So we're not thinking about or talking about the schools or the hospitals or the care homes that are still drenched in this cladding. We are 21 months on and our government has still found it not necessary to ban that form of cladding. And now we have to understand, Grenfell 2 is waiting to happen. Grenfell was predicted. Before the fire happened at Grenfell, the concerns of fire safety within the building was spoken about endless times, messages, emails, phone calls, and it was just ignored and ignored again. And the, I think the most upsetting thing now is that 20 months, 21 months on and 72 lives gone, and an entire community of people suffering with anxiety and depression since the tragedy, and we are still not putting a ban on this sort of cladding on our tall buildings. And I think that's where the question really needs to be asked. We understand 
how it could have been avoided. But if Grenfell 2 was to happen again now, there is no excuse because, I mean, this country, we have, we, we have the power to make sure that it, it doesn't happen. And it shouldn't fall for, to people like ourselves and, and the people of Grenfell United, which is a, a group of survivors and bereaved who have come together to really be pushing this message. It should be, it should be common sense. I mean, you, you understand that the cladding is the reason why the, the building went up so quickly, but yet we're still okay to leave many other buildings still in, in the same position. And that's 100 plus buildings in London alone. We're talking 400 plus across the country. Um, and from my point of view, I couldn't imagine going to sleep in, in a building now knowing that it could take someone to leave a cigarette on a sofa or some electrical fault or just one freak accident for an entire building to go up is, 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 is quite upsetting. Um, and it's quite disappointing from, from our government and, and from our, the council as well that where, where we are. I mean, it's really, really frustrating. Hence why we try to get the message out there because the group, the community, the survivors and the bereaved really should be focusing right now on getting their lives back to normal and getting back to day-to-day -day lives. But instead, they're fighting and challenging and jumping hurdles just to make sure that what happened to them doesn't happen again to anyone else. And, and that in itself is wrong, because like I said, it, it's a, it, to me, it's a very easy decision to make that none of our buildings should be drenched in, in petrol, in which the cladding is. I want to pick up on some points that uh, they have made here on the panel and it's the role of activism and how a lot of us have come together in, uh, in an approach to activism. Activism is such a disgusting word to, in the use of today. Uh, it seems like the only people that, that perform activism or are active parts of, of uh, protests tend to be either students or extreme parties. Thing is, I don't think people understand that activism is actually every day to day living assuming that you want to change something. And that change doesn't have to be something radical. Uh, and I think that's what one of the things that us as a community are trying to do on a small scale and on a large scale. So Ziad mentioned Grenfell United. I am a committee member at Grenfell United where I have been elected by the bereaved and survivors to, to put myself in a post where I'm actually in a position to actually change legislation and, and whatnot. And the way that I treat activism isn't necessarily by going out on the street, which we do. Ziad leads a silent march every month on the 14th, uh, on the 14th of every month. But it's also about trying to change perspectives. And this idea that just because people lived in social housing around the area, it does not necessarily mean that we are uneducated people. And the education isn't necessarily a certificate on a wall. Um, it's also about experience of life and understanding that it's not always about uh, a degree or your GCSEs or your A-levels, that shouldn't matter. What matters is your passion and to make sure that you can live with yourself depending on what it is that you're fighting for. And the one thing that we are fighting for is that this never happens again, but also at the same time, allowing people to understand that if this were to happen again, we have a community behind what the people who were suffered a terrible tragedy like the one they, that, that we did in Grenfell. And in the few weeks and months and years after the fire happened, these were the people that were here to, to support us. Um, and I think it's really important to, to distinguish that this idea of activism being a disgusting word needs to be changed. We need to continue fight to make sure change happens. We need to continue to understand that you know, be it a simple letter to your MP, to your local MP, uh, small things, if you take part in a small thing, things can change for the better. And we have been trying to change a lot. Uh, we, uh, Ziad was mentioning about the combustible cladding. Um, we are trying to change to make sure that combustible materials aren't on the outside of buildings. And I'm not here to try and explain to you why that is the case. So I have a, I have a background in science, but what I'm trying to say is that it takes small steps and if one step at a time we will make this country better, um, especially when it comes to fire safety and fire regulation. And what we can ask you to do 
is support us and understand that the story that sometimes the media portrays isn't the full story. Um, yeah. But even then, again, going, just adding on to Tiago's point, I think a lot of my frustration comes from the fact that people like Tiago are here 21 months on mentioning that they are fighting for a change. These are people who left a building on fire and just managed, lucky to have their lives, and 21 months on, they are still fighting to have that change. And I think that's the most disappointing situation about everything that's happened. We can then talk about things like the criminal investigation that's currently going on. And, you know, we find ourselves in a position where uh, I don't want to jump to paranoia or jump to using the term, it's a cover up or a cover up's happening, but we're living it. And I have to be real with you guys, we are actually living this situation. We have one of the richest councils, one of the richest boroughs in the country. Um, and in the aftermath of Grenfell Tower, no word of a lie, we were left to pick up the pieces alone, literally. These kind of relationships that you see are bond here and the bond that we've grown and formed with many other people within the community have all come from being left in a very dark place alone. And it's important to understand that, important for people to remember that we weren't dealt with properly. The community wasn't looked after. It wasn't dealt with in a manner of extreme emergency. It wasn't dealt with in the manner of, imagine we had a terrorist attack take place in London. It is all systems go, support, support, support. And so it should be. But then when you have 72 lives and a whole tower block burning to inferno, and then you spend that night from the early hours of the morning running around for about 19, 20 hours sorting donations from everyday people to then wake up the next day and to still see no council representatives, no form of structure, nothing really from central government to say, look, this is where you need to go if you're affected. Survivors were left to create lists on walls with door numbers. And one by one, when you meet someone that you knew lived in the tower, you would write that person's name down. Instead of the council providing residents with a list of people who were registered to live in that building. And then you start asking yourself, why? Why, why have they disappeared? Why are they not here helping? Why are they not giving us some form of structure? And then you have to look to the reality of it. Is it the council's fault into why the cladding was put on that building in the first place? I also think, it's it's, it's a case of you can't help what you don't understand. I mean, us as humans, we're all guilty of walking past uh, someone on the street, a beggar. You might feel sorry for him, but how do you help him? Like, you, if you can't speak to him, you can't understand what he's saying. He might speak a different language or a bit of slang, or he might not be able to talk. And I think that's what it was with, with the council. That, touching on what Tiago says, it's, it's a culture of contempt that they don't understand us. They just. I think they might have actually wanted to help, but they didn't even know where to start. They don't know us. They don't, we're just a, a, a number to them, a rent book and a number. They don't understand there's educated people. One of the smartest girls in the country died that night in Grenfell. They don't understand that stuff. So they were, they were just stuck. I personally don't think it was a lack of understanding. No, honestly, I think it was a blatant disregard. There's that. I think it was a blatant that, but disregard then there's also the lack for of the understanding. Rights to be safe in your own home. Because like you say, 20 months And I months feel on, like central government still don't believe that there's a right to be safe in your own home as there are thousands of people still sleeping, scared that they're gonna die in their homes. I think if central government genuinely cared, if they genuinely cladding cared, would have been taken it. down immediately, okay? After a school shooting in this country, handgun pistols were banned immediately so it couldn't happen again, okay? It's even easier to remove cladding off of all of these buildings than it is to knock on doors and take back guns. I think that's where the activism steps in. It's about trying to change the mentality of not just the councils, but a lot of the country also, and a lot of just people in general, man. Like I said, we, as a, as a me, I can admit that I've walked past someone without offering help, seeing that he needs help, and so it happens. There's a, there is a big culture of contempt in this country now. There's a lot of selfishness going on. And it's just about supporting each other. I've been saying it from day. If we make a change in North Ken, who's to say that Camden won't see what we're doing in North Ken and it might mirror? And that's how it starts. It's just about supporting each other and understanding that everyone's struggles and glories, they all, they all come together. When you're in a community, everything has to come together. You can't divide things. 
Otherwise you end up in our situation where we're begging for help and no one even knows how to help 20 mo 21 months on. So I think- Can I know. ask from you guys, do you mind if I, if I ask from you guys, um, before we'd, we'd, we'd come today, what, what was your understanding of, of that night in Grenfell and what's your understanding of what's happening now, 21 months on, if anyone wants to? Which shows exactly um, the lack of information being provided and the fact that, you know, it's the biggest loss of life, life on English soil since the war. Do you understand how big that is since the war? And it just gets played down. It gets played down. And, you know, we're trying. We're really, really, really trying. But the support is, is more, than, more than necessary because our voices alone clearly um, need backing. We need, we need more and we need change to happen. The Silent Walk. Has anyone heard of the Grenfell Silent Walk? So the Silent Walk is something that happens on the 14th of every month. It's happened for the last 21 months now. Um, and in the, in the, a bit about how, how it started is, it kind of represents the way we were left as, as, as a community. Those first four days, um, a justice campaign was launched and for the first time, the streets went silent. And Labrock Grove in the first four days after Grenfell, I, I kid you not, it was something out of a movie scene. There were endless donations, thousands of boxes of clothes, food, which was beautiful and very heartwarming. But then without the help and support of council and local government into anywhere for us to store this or even put these things anywhere, it then became, after day three, it actually became a hindrance. It became a hassle because we were now creating further fire safe fire issues by storing endless amounts of cardboard boxes and clothes and food and things were dirty and contaminated, mice under buildings, rats. Um, and we decided to all come together and, and, and you know, to be able to then fall into silence after the place felt like a war zone was something that kind of really hit all of our hearts. And it was the first time, and for me personally, it was the first time in those four days where you could actually think. You had a chance to, to think, and it wasn't adrenaline guiding and leading your, your each and every move. Um, and then we realised the power of us being together. The first walk had about 20 to 30 people potentially, um, and it grew month in, month out. And it's that support, it's just passing on the message and making sure that those people then leave. And you know, it allows us to honour those, those lives that were gone that day. And it allows us to make sure that people are understanding and hearing about, which sounds like it's contradicting ourselves because the walk is in their absolute silence. But our voices were taken that night. The lack of support was stripped from us. And it was the only way for us to really, really come together. And that, and that silence, it speaks a thousand words. Um, and I welcome anyone who, who hasn't joined. It takes place on the 14th of every month. Please come if you can, show your support to the local community. Um, it's a very moving time. Um, it can be very emotional, but that's when you really kind of grasp an understanding of how many people are really suffering. People, not just people who have come out of the tower, the community itself, which holds thousands, is in a really bad place at the moment. The suffering, emotionally, mentally, mental health is, is a big concern. And we don't want help and handouts. I don't think we're a community who needs charity as such. We need unity and we need change. We need to be that guiding force into making sure, like I keep saying, that Grenfell never happens again. Um, and we can't do it without the support from people like yourselves, from people within our own community, Greater London. Um, people have organised silent walks to take place in Manchester, in Brighton, in Birmingham, Milton Keynes. And it's just those gentle reminders, Bristol. Um, and it's just important to just re remind people and, and do some research and kind of like, people have to understand that the struggle is, is as bad as it was 21 months on, as it was on the 14th of June, 15th of June, 16th of June. When, when the fire actually had taken place. Well, I think my question before we hand over to perhaps question to the audience is, if there's been so little change 21 months on in the response of the authorities, what do you think will need to happen in order to get either you know, Westminster or local authorities to actually pay attention, to actually listen and to actually want to do something? 
from my point of view, we can't go anywhere. We can't disappear now. 21 months on, a lot of people might feel deflated or feel like, uh, me as well, me included. There's days I wake up and I think, I can't do this anymore. Like I can't, physically I can't, mentally I can't. But the way it's being dragged out and the way the inquiry is being dragged out from, call me paranoid, but it's, to me it's a sign of that's exactly what they would want from us. They want us to fizzle away and to lose care and to, to stop the fight now. But as I've mentioned to central government who've, who we've managed to sit down and speak in front of, we're not going anywhere and our friends and families aren't going anywhere and our neighbours aren't going anywhere and we just need to make sure that our togetherness is consistent um, and we have to show no weakness and it's, it's, it's a horrible situation to be in because we shouldn't be in that situation where we're treating this like a fight because those lives were lost, they're innocent lives. Why are we fighting now for change? Why are we fighting to make sure that someone is held accountable for this? And when I say held accountable, someone like myself, I'm a, I'm a brown-skinned male, um, potentially look quite rough to some people. If I was at fault, even by accident, if I had caused a loss of life during a criminal investigation, nine times out of 10, I'm going to be held on remand in prison while they investigate and continue. But when it's the rich and powerful who are at fault, things get treated a lot differently. And then that leaves us to then make sure that the community stay together and that our numbers stay big and we stay united to make sure that, you know, we might not have the financial backing of, of some of the people who have caused Grenfell to happen, but we've got the emotional support and we've got the love of family and the community to make sure that, and to me that's more than any amount of wealth is, is worth. We've become brothers, we've become sisters, families, literally. Some of us had never sat in a room together before Grenfell. And now, you know, we're, like I said, we're all, we're all very close. And there's hundreds of more back home who, you know, we've become a, a family. We need to make sure that that family grows. And as that family grows, more and more people understand the situation of what had happened. And people can then really start adding their voice and making sure that you can all be part of making sure that no one else has to suffer in the same way those residents of Grenfell Tower suffered. To be honest, in the short term, even if central government wanted to make a difference, I think with this Brexit malarkey, I don't think they're going to pass any legislation anytime soon. Right? So I think all we can do to make a difference is, as he said, to increase the growth of support, right? petition support, so the government clearly see that the wider population of the United Kingdom stand behind us and understand that there is a right to feel safe in your home and that there's a right for justice for 72 lives lost. And I think the only way to get that is to gain support from the public. It's sad that such a big tragedy um, was the reason why people had to unite, as in, um, it's sad that it took a big fight, it took 72 lives, it costed 72 lives for people to unite and um, try to improve the system. Um, and even then, we haven't even improved the system because nothing has come out of it. Um, so definitely, it, it was just right as well, is I, try not, I don't really think about that point too much and how the tragedy of Grenfell forced us to unite. And I think a message that I'd always pass on to anyone, no matter what your community's like, get involved before a tragedy happens. If you can form a group in your local communities or residents, or even into where you're staying for university, because I'm sure not everyone in this room is from Oxford. Um, well, I don't think anyone is from Oxford. So, you know, it's just important about making sure that together, you, you, you know, you, you stay together and no. you can't make change alone. It will take, it will Justice take numbers. relies on ignorance. Like I said before, I was, I was ignorant to what my mum was telling me. Grenfell, Grenfell Action Group, I didn't sign their petition. I lived 20 seconds away from it. I didn't sign anything to stop what was happening in Grenfell. 
I didn't sign a petition even for my own estate when they threatened to knock it down. So injustice relies on ignorance. Like, you have to stay on top of the ball. Like, you have to be on top of it at all times. As a community, as an individual, it's the only way, man. It is the only way. Because we can say, yeah, Grenfell was preventable by the government, but was, we could, as a community, we could also have prevented it. And I think that's a lot of the things we need to speak about moving forward to other communities that are going, for, or possibly could possibly go through it, that as a community, you have to stick together and stay, stick to your word. Otherwise, they're going to run and do what they want anyway. It's about backing your community, man. I think the problem we have in this country, as you said, is a culture of content. We care more about profits than people. Okay, I think especially in local government, tight budgets, austerity, they're more just like numbers people then. They, they forget they're elected for a specific role to help the community, to manage the community. And that community cons consists of, of genuine people, human beings that are alive, some of whom genuinely need help from the council. Social housing, social care, certain health care, mental health budgets. But they forget, they think, we can just cut a bit of this, cut a bit of that, cut a bit of that. They don't realise it genuinely affects people's lives. And it takes a loss of life on, this, on such a scale for you to sit back and reflect and think, this was actually preventable. If we had sat back and thought, let's th think a little bit more deeply into the lives this, these are affecting, or actually read the emails that were being sent by the Grenfell Action Group, 72 people wouldn't be dead, we wouldn't be here, the community would probably be a nicer place. I think it's, we need a culture of change now. We need to understand that politicians need to work for people. We do need people that are good with budgets because you can't keep overspending as they did in the Blairite years, right? It doesn't work. But to cut back on such important things, such as feeling safe in your home, I think is ridiculous, man. And it was, as I said, it's the, the reason we're here today. Um, in hindsight, everything's preventable. Um, so it's really easy saying this from the side of it having already happened. But um, it takes one person to unite group, to unite a group. Um, it all started with one person to unite, to make Grenfell United. And um, uh, I guess what we're trying to say is, we can't do anything about it now. 72 people have died and um, we lost our home. And now all we have to do is just like keep our chins up and um, try and make a change. Um, and without people, we won't be able to make that change. And then do we have any points or questions from the audience? Um, I was just wondering, because you've talked about the kind of culture of change and the holding politicians to account. Um, and it kind of seemed like that was part of the job of the media. Um, but then the media coverage of Grenfell, a lot of that came across awfully as well. And I was wondering kind of what change you think needs to happen in the media and whether it has a place in kind of like the future changes you want to make. I think when it comes to the media, uh, the first couple of weeks has, uh, were absolutely hectic. Uh, no one really knew what they were doing. Everyone was just running around the place trying to find a story because everyone wanted the latest scoop. I think as time progressed, stories started to become more focused and the right voices started to come out. Originally, en anyone was just picked out of the street and said, we need a, we need a comment and we need, we need it from someone. And so some of the initial stories were quite harsh and untrue. Um, one story that particularly comes to mind is a national newspaper, which I will not name, uh, naming the person in, 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 whose, in whose flat the fire started. Everything that they mentioned in that, in that specific report was completely untrue and completely fabricated. However, as time progressed, um, bereaved survivors in the local community started building relationships with individual, uh, with individual journalists, with individual reporters. And it was through there that a majority of the, the more positive and correct stories come, started to come out. It's very difficult to change the perception of media um, because thing is, that one story that I mentioned is still being used today on Twitter, even though it has been, it has been taken back by that specific newspaper. But 
what we can do is learn to, to actually read the sources behind it. And don't take your opinion only from one particular news, news source. Take it from multiple and then, you know, Form your own opinion. Exactly. That's I think the most. That's the, probably the, one of the most important things, and that doesn't just have to be with Grenfell. That's with anything in life. Take media with a pinch of salt. Do your own. If you're interested, do your own research. Try and understand why it is that that certain newspaper or that certain source would say what they are saying, and then make your own opinion. And I think that's something that uh, nowadays doesn't tend to happen. We tend to be. Uh, guided by headlines and without reading into it properly. Um, and so, again, media is, it, unless you have a direct source, you know, there is a direct source to what is actually going on, always take anything you read with a pinch of salt. I'd agree. I think on the media point of things as well, I think um, it's a catch-22, I mean, uh, you're right, a lot of the media that, that came out in, in the aftermath of Grenfell was, was toxic and it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't the true reflection of, of what had actually happened that day. But then on the counter to that, we have social media and a platform on social media where the real life events and the real day-to-day -day struggles of individuals, whether it be the man who owned the shop round the corner or the person who drinks too much on the side of the street every evening, do you know what I mean? These are the real voices. These are the real truths of, of what had happened that day. And Tiago's right. I mean, headlines sell. Bad news sells. You know, you don't hear anything about the one year anniversary and 12,000 people turned up to walk in silence through Labrick Grove. You won't hear that. But you'll hear that this person maybe was, he wasn't a British citizen or this person was an illegal. And, you know, I mean, bad news sells. And, and that's the sad, the sad side of things. But we have to make sure that, you know, we can tap in using social media. You can tap in to people and outlets that are directly living the situation. And I mean, yeah, it's, al it's always best to always, of course, be careful with social media and the, and the news that you're, you're getting off it because a lot of fake news as well. But at least it comes from an individual who tends to or more time have been a part of that situation rather than than the press and the reporters. And yeah, after Grenfell happened, the, whole st the streets were full of men running around in suits with cameras and women and reporters and notebooks. And we just need a story, we need this. Uh, CBN, uh, American TV, Australian TV, come get the story and then leave. Mm -hmm. And when you're, s yeah, it was a hard time. A lot of the news that came out was probably not our fault personally, but from a community point of view, we are suffering. We have just witnessed trauma, tragedy, something that we couldn't even, even to this day, I can't get my head around completely. And you're very vulnerable at a time talking like that. And, you know, it's very important to, to try and understand who you trust and, and who to speak to. Um, and as Tiago said, as the months had gone on, you kind of be, you're able to filter who is there to portray the right message and, and who isn't. And, People like Rags Martel, for example, on ITV News, ITN News. Um, people like that have never let the story drop. And I met Rags about a week or two after the fire, and he was walking outside Latimer Road train station in a shirt and suit. And I told him, I thought you were an absolute idiot. I said, what are you doing here? Do you know what I mean? Look, we're here, we're struggling, we're sweating, we need help. People are fasting, people are trying to break fast, and you're walking around trying to catch a story. And then as the months kind of progressed, I understood that he wasn't there for the headline, he was there for the entire story. And it's just about understanding people like that. I was naive to it at first. People like Reese, for example, he, he's got a great eye for spotting who, <laughs> who's the right ones and who the wrong ones are. Um, but at the time, I was pretty blind to it. But then, you know, you speak to friends, he's a brother of mine, and you kind of understand, it's like, Oh, I never saw it like that, and I didn't think about it like that, but media's a catch-22, you know? They can never, you can never get the exact story unless you've lived it, and hence why we felt it was important for us to come, because everyone sat on this table have lived it in some form, some way or another, we've lived the disaster that had happened, and you, you, you won't get much more truth than, than what comes from us, to be honest, and our community. Following on. The issue we have with the media, you have to remember that they do sensationalise stories to generate revenue. 
which is that's the, that's the only reason they're able to publish news in the first place. However, you do actually need them. They play a, a fundamental role in society of educating us and, and telling us what's going on. And we actually need the mainstream media to get our message across, to be completely honest. Joe Bloggs that lives in Scunthorpe isn't going to sign a petition unless he knows exactly what's going on. The only way he's going to be educated about what's going on with our cause is through the mainstream media. So you have to understand, they may sensationalise stories to sell papers, but we, we do actually need them at the same time. You need help from the oppressors, man. It's always the way, man. But I think, yeah, with the media, like he says, we need it and we don't. So you just take it, take it how you want it. Each journalist is going to have an opinion. Opinions are never facts. So you take their opinion, check it with the facts, and then you just make your own. That's what I do with the news in general. In the age of social media, it's difficult to formulate your own opinion because you get criticised either way. And... Um, Coming up to Oxford um, this afternoon, I actually read a comment on um, an article posted on Instagram how um, this guy commented something ridiculous, which I don't even want to say because it's disgusting, and I reported it immediately because um, he formulated his own opinion based on an article, how everyone that lived there was an illegal immigrant, and how... Um, they don't have the right. They don't have the right to live there, and um, they weren't English, and just based on silly stories like that. And it, and then you kind of think, is it their fault that they're this ignorant, or is it the media's fault that um, put this idea in their head to begin with? And um, it's difficult to actually know the truth um, because. People read from different sources and then just assume they know what happened. I've spoken to loads of people um, that were telling me about the fire and what they think happened, and then I'm like, that's absurd, I was there, I know this is bull crap. And, um, and it's crazy how people really believe in what they read, and um, they say that, oh, there's no point in justice, like, what are you going to do about it now? There's no point, you can't exactly catch... Um, um, you can't pinpoint who, who's to blame for Grenfell, which means you should just stop now. And it's kind of ridiculous because it's like 72 people died. I lost my home. Loads of others lost our home. And it's, um, it's kind of insulting that we're just going to let the culprit run away. And um, I lost everything, everything you can imagine. Not just me, my brother, everyone that lived there. And it's sad how people just... They just look at whether um, being English or not, being a Christian or not, is... Um, they care that people aren't English um, more than 72 people's lives dying, um, which is quite sad, really. Um, we all have to remember, we, we have to remember someone gave the OK for Grenfell to be refurbished. Someone okayed a cheaper form of cladding and someone signed that off. It's not a system, an individual, a human being decided that no, we're not going to spend X amount on that, we can get this one for cheaper. There, there's nothing more clear than that, you know? And we need to make sure that people understand that. Grenfell isn't a freak accident. Someone had signed that off. And someone, while doing that, had to have known. Now I'm assuming, but someone would have had to have known that there was more of a risk by using a cheaper form of cladding than there was the original cladding that was meant to be used on the building. And when we seek for justice, these people have to be held responsible in the exact same way that I would be held responsible for my actions. If I did anything of violence or anything of criminal damage, I expect to be held responsible and I expect to be punished for whatever I have done. That's something that I have to live with and I have to understand. But when you've got these, these extremely powerful and, and very, very rich individuals, it just makes the job a lot harder, a lot harder. And we just need to keep putting pressure on because, you know, they have to know that we know. And if we know, as your everyday people who are not built for this, 
then a police investigation team has to know. The council themselves have to know because we can't just come, to, you know, we, like I said, we're not, we're not professionals in this, in this industry. And for us to have most of the answers, it's very shocking that the, the council and the police um, and the government are still struggling to, to find those answers. The delay of the, the public inquiry is insulting. Um, no fixed date of actually when it's meant to start again is insulting. But then people, when you're living it, you have to keep reminding yourself, why? There has to be something that is trying to be covered up or there has to be a way to try and... We are too loud and we are too united right now for this to continue. So they play the long, the long race, they play the long game and I guess it's to see if we are able to, to stick and be committed to it. And again, my main message is we are not going anywhere um, and hopefully the support from yourselves, friends, families, you can help pass that message on um, and we can keep reminding that gentle knock on, on the door of central government to understand that, look, we're not, we're not decreasing in numbers, we're increasing. 21 months on and we're still increasing, the support is still coming in um, and that's the only way for us to really guarantee that someone's held accountable and that change comes from this situation. Adding to what Zaya just said, I think we do genuinely feel insulted by the police. I think the fact that they're now saying they're waiting for an independent inquiry to complete their investigation, I think is insulting. In my 26 years of living, I have never known the police to say, we are not able to investigate this until somebody else does first. Okay, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not shy to run in with the police, I'll be completely honest. I've, I've been in trouble in the past and they've never said, we're not going to investigate a crime that you committed until a third party agency has investigated. We'll then gather the facts from that agency to compile our own investigation. I've never heard of that happening. I've never heard of a drug dealer being arrested, as, as Risa said, and they say, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna investigate you yet. We're gonna wait to see if we can find the source of the drugs in Afghanistan mm. to find the heroin, who makes the heroin, to see what's going on, and then we'll decide whether to press charges on yourself. I think it's genuinely insulting. I think it's ridiculous. And I think we need the help of yourselves and everybody else in the wider population to, to yeah. call I on think change. Just, just keep yeah. asking yourselves why. When you leave here today and you think about what Mickey's just said, keep asking yourself why. Why, why, why? And you'll naturally be led to the conclusion of, of something terrible happened that day and someone's trying to cover themselves from owning up and taking responsibility of what had happened in, in Grenfell that day. 72 people have lost their lives and not a single search warrant has been issued and not a single arrest has been made in 21 months. Not one electronic device has been seized. I think that's ridiculous and I don't think that is uh, prompt or effective investigating by the police. I think the fact, the fact of the matter is the bulk of the, uh, the evidence is probably missing now. And we'd never know because in 21 months, the police haven't effectively tried to come after it. Just back to that saying, injustice relies on ignorance, man. I swear, that's all it is. Man. Just to add to it, guys, a journey of a thousand miles starts with just one single step. So just asking for you guys' help today is a, another step in that right direction. Um. I think that there's, there is one point I do want to make. Um, I'm from part of a generation that doesn't ever remember Hillsborough, the Hillsborough disaster, ever being branded as something that they did to themselves. So I assume that all of you are around my age and so therefore a lot of you have always grown up thinking that Hillsborough was actually the police's fault. And the reason I'm bringing up Hillsborough is because Part of what we do takes inspiration from their fight. We, we saw how they stuck together, and to this day, there are still multiple fans of Liverpool Football Club who still stand strong together with, with Hillsborough. And we take massive, massive inspiration from the way that they acted and they reacted. It wasn't, it wasn't violent, it was in a way that even when media was t 
telling the whole country that they were wrong. They continued pushing and through a lot of adversity, they managed to push through and push through and push through. And with the help of other journalists and with the help of politicians, they managed to get their voice across to which they then got the independent panel of Hillsborough. I've had the pleasure of meeting some of the families from Hillsborough and I've had the pleasure of meeting Bishop James Jones, who was chair of that panel. And the one thing that I've, I've always taken in my stride is, is the understanding that they, when they approached us and they said, look, we see that your fight is going to take many, many years, but don't ever give up. And that's not just something that, that is for bereaved or the survivors. It's also for the local community and for the whole country. Because without the support of the rest of the country, we wouldn't be here today. Because government only cares about what its people cares about. And without the help and support and the understanding of everyone around the country, they would never continue pushing on what we are asking them to change. And it's important that you have a bigger voice than you, may, th th than you may think. And that's why it's always important that, I know that politics isn't always an interesting subject for the youth, um, but recently I've tried to get myself as involved with politics as I can. I've never really been a political person. Um, I was, you know, every so often, a couple of weeks before the election, I'd, I'd be interested in listening to what they had to say. Apart from that, I didn't really have much of a, I, didn't feel like I had much of a say. Now, on the other hand, I feel like you need to go out and you need to, you know, it, it all goes back to activism. Activism isn't just the it's sense. It's a basic survival yeah. now. As a youth, I, I, I'm being honest, and to get into politics that is relative to you and your life, it's like a basic survival tool now, growing up in England, because like I said, I was so ignorant to it that I nearly lost my house. My house was nearly knocked down and then Grenfell happened and we got a letter saying we're not knocking your house down because of Grenfell. So if Grenfell never happened, I'd be out of a house. So it's just stick to the politics that is relative to you and try and help yourself and community and empower yourself that way. And don't wait for anything and someone else to start a, a group or for, you to, for your rent to go up or your council tax to go up. Don't wait for your whole road to complain. You start it. And, and it just, and try and, yeah, have yeah, the ripple true. effect. Even, even taking Grenfell away from the situation, for you guys, anything that you feel passionate about or you really believe in, even if everyone thinks you're absolutely bonkers for believing that way, keep pushing, keep going. If you really feel something within telling you that this is right and this needs to happen, keep plugging away, keep going, keep pushing, keep pushing, and your voice will be heard. I think that's another part of our cause as a community majority of people I know that are my peer group, I think I'm the only person I know that is like interested in politics. The only person. Probably the only person in my family that even knows who our local MP is. And I think that state of ignorance that my community was in is now over. I think we are slowly waking up. And part of our cause is to try and wake up the wider community and the whole country I think the fact that we don't get 100% turnouts on elections, on general elections, is ridiculous. I think it shows that the majority of people in the country are so disenfranchised, they feel like their vote doesn't matter, that we're just allowing the politics of now to continue and perpetuate forever. And this is not a journey for the swift, it's just for those who can endure it, and we're here to see it out, yeah. Anything? <laughs> I think if we're calling it to an end, could we ask that you guys... Thank you end? to you guys as well for taking Friday afternoon, for taking your time to come and, and listen to our speakers. It's really appreciated, so thank you guys. No, on behalf of everyone, I want to say thank you guys sincerely for coming. I really, really do appreciate it. And could we end it? <laughs> <laughs>